Okay, our next speaker is another wonderful colleague, Paula Hammond. Uh, Paula is the David H. Cook Professor of Engineering here at MIT. She's also the head of the Department of Chemical Engineering, and she's the member of the Koch Institute and one of our neighbors. Um, her, the core of her work is the use of electrostatics to generate functional materials with highly controlled architecture. And she's going to tell you about that today in the context of layered materials, nano-layered materials. Paula was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2016, the National Academy of Engineering in 2017, and is also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Welcome, Paula. Well, good afternoon. I'm very excited to have the chance to talk to you today, especially uh, when I think about the last time I gave my Coke Symposium talk and my computer crashed. So <laughs> we have much better luck this morning, this afternoon. I'm going to be describing, as uh, Sangeeta said, some of the work that we're doing using electrostatics to package components uh, for delivery to cells. It's a very simple process. It involves alternating positive and negative charge. You can essentially take any substrate that has an initial charge, immerse it into a dilute aqueous solution that contains something of opposite charge. And as long as that component is multivalent, it will absorb until ultimately the surface charge is reversed. At that point, you get electrostatic repulsion, and nothing else can deposit on that substrate. So you can rinse it and immerse it into another solution that contains a material of opposite charge. Now, you can continue to do this alternating absorption step, plus and minus, and as long as you follow the rules of alternating charge, you can build the film up infinitely thick. Now, the thickness of each of these layers can be controlled with pH and ionic strength, but they typically range from anything from as thin as a half nanometer to as thick as tens of nanometers. And what we can incorporate it in, into these films range from small drug molecules to proteins to nucleic acids. So this becomes a very compelling way of incorporating a drug into a thin film and getting a very high density or loading of that drug. Now I should mention that other complementary interactions can count as well. So you can use hydrogen bonding, disulfide bridges, and a range of other methods to incorporate these materials into thin films. Now I've been describing this as if we've been working with a macroscopic system. And indeed, we do make a number of different materials that coat large-scale material systems. However, it's possible to also coat down to the nanometer scale. And in our case, we're using a nanoparticle as a substrate to deliver a drug delivery nanoparticle. Now, the idea here is that we'd like to be able to address very advanced kinds of cancers, those that have become resistant. And for us, we're very interested in a number of, of cancers, including non-small cell lung cancer and advanced serous ovarian cancer. A number of these cancers have undergone genetic mutations which allow the cancer cell to survive even in the presence of a chemotherapy drug. So the idea is to try and package your chemotherapy drug into the core of one of these nanoparticles and then wrap around that nanoparticle a package that contains siRNA that will essentially silence the gene that enables the cancer cell to survive. Finally, we have to incorporate a final outer layer that's going to allow this nanoparticle to be introduced into the bloodstream, circulate for a long enough time that it can eventually accumulate in the tumor. And it's not until we get into the tumor that we can actually have action or effect. So this external layer becomes extremely important. Now, in doing all of this, uh, we require several different kinds of science. Uh, we need to be able to engage engineers and physical chemists we have to get to know our biologist friends at the Koch Institute very well because uh, they are actually the ones who understand what targets we want to work on. And we also have to be able to get close to clinicians and understand how we can address the disease more broadly. Now in doing this, the whole idea is to get this nanoparticle to flow through the bloodstream and target the tumor. There are several ways in which then this can be achieved. Now, in general, we're using a nanoparticle because uh, a number of uh, observations have included the fact that when cancers grow very rapidly, they develop blood vessels that are imperfect. And some of that imperfection leads to leaks or permeability in the tumor blood vessel. Now, in those cases, we can use nanoparticle size itself to get a higher accumulation of the nanoparticle in the tumor. So this is one way in. 
It's not the only way in, and in fact, in the field of nanomedicine, we are always talking about other ways in which we can defeat the, the endothelial barrier of the blood vessel and tumors very specifically. But it does allow us to get in, and you can see an example here of a subcutaneous tumor that is, a, is essentially implanted on the flanks of mice. Uh, we've injected a quantum dot layered with our system, and we can see that it is accumulating in the tumors after a period of about 24 hours. So we can get in. However, once we get in, we also need a way to stay in long enough that we can get tumor cells to take up the nanoparticle uh, and essentially allow us to deliver our drug. This means that we need to use several different methods to encourage uh, this level of uptake. Uh, one of the things that we found is unique about layer-by-layer -layer approaches is that we're working with polyacids and polybases. This means that we're essentially designing outer layers that have an effective isoelectric point. We have a nanoparticle, therefore, that at pH 7.4 has an outer shell. Hopefully this is somewhat visible. Uh, that outer shell is densely charged, has a net, val net uh, negative charge of minus 30 millivolts, and uh, it also has a large amount of associated water molecules with it. When it's in the bloodstream, it tends to have a very low protein absorption. And this is something that we've tested on flat substrates. Uh, this is actually an advantage because it means that we don't get opsonized by proteins and essentially uh, cleared from the body by the MPS system. However, as we begin to go down in pH, it turns out that we get very close to the isoelectric point of these nanoparticles. In our case, as we get to about 6.8 to 6.5, uh, we begin to see this nanoparticle change. Uh, we're essentially erasing some of those electrostatic interactions that allowed us to create a network. So we also get swelling. We end up with a nanoparticle that is close to neutral and slightly positive in charge. It has a much softer outer shell, so the modulus has changed. And it turns out that this kind of nanoparticle is highly interactive with cells. So once we get into the tumor, we have a large amount of cellular uptake that can take place simply by changing the pH. And this is an advantage because a number of solid tumors, especially these aggressive types, have hypoxic regions. Now, uh, we can take advantage of tumor microenvironment. Hypoxia is one example of that. Uh, we've also begun to look at ways in which we can take advantage of cathepsins and other kinds of enzymes that are excreted in tumors uh, so that we get specific uptake within the tumor. However, what's most beautiful is when we can get a very selective uptake that is guided by the specific molecular specificity of the cancer cell itself. And because tumor cells will often overexpress certain receptors, we can decorate our nanoparticle with a ligand that binds that receptor and enables endocytic uptake. Uh, this is the case, in fact, for hyaluronic acid, which was the choice for a number of our layer-by-layer layer nanoparticles. HA is uh, a very simple, highly negatively charged carboxylated polysaccharide. It is ubiquitous in the extracellular matrix. And uh, because it is a polysaccharide that enables cell binding, it engages the CD44 receptor. And it turns out that the CD44 receptor is actually overexpressed in a large number of the cancer types we're interested in. So we can use this as a way of essentially achieving a triple threat. We can get nanoparticle targeting based on its size. We can get nanoparticle uptake enhanced by the tumor microenvironment, and we can use the cell receptor as a way to even further enhance the degree of uptake that we see by uh, tumor cells. And here we can see the relative uptake observed in uh, a layer-by-layer -layer coated versus an uncoated film. Uh, and we can see that we can titrate away some of these interactions simply by adding excess HA. So we're seeing something like a 15-fold increase or enhancement. Here you can see a tumor section. In this tumor section, uh, we have used IV injection to introduce the nanoparticle. When we look at the tumor, we can see the stromal cells on the outside of the tumor cell. Um, this is simply the nuclei uh, labeled by DAPI. And we can see CD44 labeled here. This is actually a triple negative breast cancer uh, cell line. And we also see our nanoparticles highly accumulated within that tumor. So we've been engineering these systems so that we can get into the tumor. Now we want to see whether or not this combination, which is essentially a one-two punch, is going to be effective in a model. So our simplest model was to use the MRP1 protein. It's a protein that's fairly well understood. 
Uh, this is essentially the pump that sits at a tumor cell membrane and pumps out uh, a number of the DNA damage drugs that we're interested in, including doxorubicin, before it can uh, essentially access the nucleus and have uh, effect. So in a very simple mouse model, uh, we used uh, xenografts established on uh, a mouse. We used a triple negative breast cancer cell line. And uh, we developed our four-layer nanoparticle. In this case, it was a liposome, which has a net negative charge. Uh, on this, we actually incorporated our layer-by-layer -layer film. Uh, and this meant that our doxorubicin got coated with siRNA against MRP1. And finally, the outer layer that was incorporated was hyaluronic acid. When we look at whether or not we can achieve knockdown in the tumor tissue, uh, we can find here that indeed we can see a very significant amount of knockdown, MRP1, uh, maybe about 85%, and we can also see this in our stains. And then of course the question is whether or not we can see this in tumor treatment. And we were excited about these results because compared to the saline control, we can see a significant reduction first when we just have doxorubicin in the nanoparticle. We do get targeting and we do get a result, which is a lowering the rate of growth of these tumors. But when we have the combination of doxorubicin with the SI against MRP1, we see that the tumors are actually getting smaller. So we see some indications of regression. Uh, we were excited about these results. Of course, we tested to see whether or not we had any sort of cytotoxic effect. We also looked for any sort of immune response. Uh, and in these early and simple studies, we have not seen any sort of negative response to the nanoparticle. This meant that we had to look at a more difficult uh, challenge for these nanoparticles and a more meaningful model. Uh, and uh, I was initially going to name this talk uh, Playing With My Friends because uh, I got to collaborate with several people in these projects. Uh, we went to Tyler Jack's lab. Uh, we learned all about his uh, KP mouse model, again, uh, which is a model of non-small cell lung cancer, particularly aggressive form, uh, which has one of the frequent mutations found in uh, lung cancer, which is uh, KRAS. And KRAS is interesting in particular because it's an oncogene that is not druggable with small molecules because of the nature of its binding pocket. Uh, we also looked at, uh, uh, in this case, this model has um, a loss of P53. P53 is, of course, the guardian gene. Uh, and we want to restore some of that P53 effector. And so we looked at a combination of siRNA against uh, KRAS and in a mere 34A microRNA that would replace the P53 function. In this image, you can see a little bit about the basics of building the nanoparticle. Uh, here you can see the zeta potential going from plus to minus to plus to minus as we layer this with uh, essentially our poly-L arginine, which was the positively charged polymer, siRNA, poly-L arginine, and hyaluronic acid. In this case, we use cisplatin, which is a preferred uh, DNA damaging drug. And uh, when we look at the relative rates of release in these systems, we have siRNA released fairly rapidly. And uh, the cisplatin, which is released over a factor of three or four times slower. Uh, this is actually important for us. Uh, we designed the nanoparticles so that we not only have a combination system, but we have a timed system. And earlier today, we talked about the importance of pharmacokinetics. What we'd like to do is use this modular nanoparticle approach to control the pharmacokinetics even after we have gotten into the cell so that we can first silence genes that are effective in avoiding the impact of chemotherapy and then release the chemotherapy drug. So in this study, uh, we look at a comparison between healthy mice and uh, the uh, mice which uh, have these uh, KP cells. These are orthotopic tumors. They're spread across the lung. And we're looking at where the nanoparticle localizes. And as you can see, uh, there's a very strong localization in the lungs of the tumored mice. This has to do with the fact that CD44 is highly overexpressed in these mice. When we look at the results, uh, here we can see the uh, micro CT images. Again, these are these scattered uh, uh, tumors. Uh, we can see that the tumor size decreases over time. And perhaps what's easier to see is that these mice survive for a much more extended time period when we have the combination compared to when we just have cisplatin. And this for us was very notable because this is a quite aggressive model. Of course, we also have to see whether or not we're affecting the pathways that we think we're affecting. 
So, uh, of course, we did uh, panels. In this case, uh, for example, we're looking for the loss of PERC if we've uh, ex uh, successfully in silenced uh, the KRAS gene. Uh, we also look at CDK6 and CERT1 uh, because we're interested in whether or not MIR34A is working, and we can see that all three of these are lowered, which is what we'd like to see, in the RNA only and the combination nanoparticle. We also see that cell proliferation in general uh, in these uh, uh, mice were lowered uh, when we introduced RNA, and even more so when we introduced the combination drug. And most importantly, we see that cell death is greatly enhanced in the combination nanoparticle. Again, I mentioned that uh, this is about uh, the things that we can do with our friends, and one of my great friends in the Koch Institute is Angie Belcher. Uh, and uh, we actually share uh, la la our labs around the fifth floor. Our students talk to each other all the time. And uh, Angie has a, a grant in uh, ovarian cancer looking at imaging. I have a grant in ovarian cancer looking at drug delivery. Our two postdocs, Lee and Janan, got together and decided that it's possible to be able to take some of the unique technologies developed in the Belcher lab, which allow um, essentially the imaging of uh, deep tissue uh, ovarian cancers and uh, use the LBL approach to direct these nanoparticles to tumors and uh, create an effective way of uh, getting imaging and drug delivery combined, image-guided drug delivery. So here you can see the general concept in this cartoon of coding a uh, nanoparticle which is capable of essentially um, emitting in this uh, second window near IR, which is uh, a wavelength range which allows us to access uh, tissues at much greater depth than more traditional imaging tools. Uh, we looked at everything from dye molecules to single wall nanotubes, quantum dots and down conversion nanoparticles, all uh, provided uh, through the Belcher Lab. And in our collaboration together, we examined uh, everything from the physical characteristics of these systems to their wavelengths and uh, optical behavior, and uh, determined that the LBL down conversion nanoparticles were really very promising in being able to uh, allow us to not only image the ovarian tumor, uh, but to avoid the background, that, which is common and uh, disrupts effective imaging in a number of other wavelength ranges. Uh, in this case, we're looking at an orthotopic ovarian tumor model uh, using uh, luciferized COV-362 cells. And we can see a, a, mark, a market difference in the imaging in the tumor cells versus these healthy mice. You see a little bit of the, mark of the uh, probe showing up in the liver. And we can see with uh, a very uh, nice uh, discernment uh, differences in our histology between tumor and the tissue next to it, in this case, gut. Uh, this is tumor against or growing into pancreas. Here we see it in liver and, of course, the tumor itself, which is very strongly decorated with, uh, these are the hyaluronic acid decorated LBL systems. This is the first step. We're uh, now looking to turn this into a theranostic uh, and use this as a way of finding small, early tumors and enabling this uh, system to be treated at the same time. Okay, my last story is, again, another uh, play with friends story. In this case, uh, I'm going to talk about a different way in which uh, we can assemble using electrostatics. Uh, in the previous examples, I created these very uh, elegant nanolayers, which allow us to control or modulate when drugs come out. But we also do a great deal of polymer synthesis in our lab. And we've developed a range of uh, oligopeptide amplifiles, uh, which uh, assemble based on charge in the presence of nucleic acids. So here you can see um, the family of these uh, based on poly uh, L aspartic acid, benzyl L aspartic acid. And uh, therefore, we have this very hydrophobic alpha helix. Uh, and what we initiate this system with gives us a hydrophilic head group. So we have head groups that are nucleic acid binding. We have nuclease shielding. This is actually a short peg chain. And we also have an endosomal buffering one, which is a zwitterion, which allows us to exit the endosome, which is critical for siRNA delivery. So the idea here is to package siRNA using these systems and use them as a co-treatment with a chemotherapy drug. So as I mentioned, we have these three different uh, macromolecules that we're going to allow to assemble. And what happens is that Together, they don't do anything unless we introduce a negatively charged 
material set, like siRNA. But when we do that, we actually create these very compact uh, nanoparticles that have a polyethylene oxide stealth layer. Um, they therefore allow us to um, administer these systems in the body. We have uh, a size of about 90 nanometers, and uh, they're serum stable, give us relatively good structural stability, and they're also cell compatible. So the question is whether or not these can actually be effective in uh, silencing, and we see that uh, they are competitive with any sort of uh, uh, lipid-based system in terms of uh, silencing efficiency. So uh, in this work, we, we are collaborating with Mike Yaffe, and this project is uh, a collaboration with my postdoc, Eric Drayden, and uh, his postdoc, Yi Wen. And we're actually interested in this uh, pathway, MK2. Uh, in Mike's lab, uh, Mike was a systems biologist. He's discovered that uh, it's possible to essentially address uh, the DNA damage pathway, which is uh, avoided when p53 is down, uh, by blocking MK2. And I'm using his diagram. This is an example of convergence, because as a chemical engineer, I, I tend to stay further away from these kinds of diagrams, and I tend to have organic molecules in them. Uh, but the general idea, and this is something that has been understood but difficult to address, is that MK2 uh, is a mediator in DNA damage repair. And in particular, uh, when DNA damage takes place, in particular with uh, cells that have lost P53, MK2 plays a more significant role and essentially rescues the cell. The idea here is to silence MK2 and therefore silence that DNA damage repair activity and allow the uh, uh, efficacy of our chemotherapy drug. The challenge is that MK2 is undruggable. Uh, there have been attempts to uh, create MK2 inhibitors, uh, but they, it has a shallow binding pocket. And the homology is very close to other proteins that we wouldn't want to drug. So uh, the idea of using sRNA is very attractive. The problem here is that if we use sRNA in a way that universally targets all cells, uh, we will make the patient much more sensitive and that could actually increase toxicity. Here's an example of mice weight loss. Uh, when MK2 is missing, you can see that when they're administered a drug like doxorubicin, uh, they are much uh, more likely to die uh, early. So this is going to be a concern. We need to target our sRNA therapy. And here's the final result of our work, we actually use the peptide amplifile system in combination with a uh, DNA damage drug uh, combination. And uh, here you can see we're introducing regular injections of our nanoparticle and comparing them to treatments with just chemotherapy alone. And we can see that there is a very meaningful gap between the combination system and the chemotherapy drug. We're excited about this work and we actually have uh, begun to look at more complex DNA damage uh, mechanisms that we can control using siRNA. And in this work, uh, we're hoping that we can move to not only uh, ovarian cancer, we're looking at non-small cell lung cancer and a range of others. So in short, we can use electrostatics as a very powerful method of creating modular delivery approaches. What's really exciting about this is that you can generate systems that are small enough to penetrate the tumor. You can uh, attach different modalities, including modalities that are developed uh, and engineered uh, in different places, and use them in this nanoparticle construct to address disease. Uh, so we're very excited about this work. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of the people who did the work. They're highlighted over here in uh, green in the corner, as well as our funders. And uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>